So Gaspar Noe is a filmmaker. He's one of the most well-known directors of contemporary art house cinema, and he has a reputation for being a provocateur, with his films being some of the most shocking ever put to celluloid. But you already know that. You've watched the Carson Runquist video. But today, I want to talk in more depth about Noe's third feature-length film, Enter the Void. See, Enter the Void is one of my absolute favorite films, and I don't really know why. Let's get into it. Enter the Void begins from the perspective of Oscar, a 20-something-year-old American in Tokyo who's a borderline drug dealer and is played by Nathaniel Brown. We begin the film in his first-person POV until about half an hour in. What do you want me to do? <gasps> yeah. The film then follows a kind of spiritual journey from before, during, and after Oscar's death until eventually he's reborn and the movie ends. A la the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And that's kind of it. I mean, there's a cast of characters around him. Such as Oscar's younger sister, Linda, played by Paz de la Huerta, with whom he's very close. Again, this is a Gaspar Noé film. His sleazy best friend Alex, played by Cyril Ra, and his other friend Victor, who's played by Baby Ali Alexander. And there is stuff that happens, don't get me wrong, but it's all rendered fairly banal by how shallowly the vast majority of these characters are drawn. What's more striking is the presentation. Enter the Void is one of the most remarkable audiovisual spectacles I've ever experienced, and it never really gets old. It's tending to say that Enter the Void is remarkable in spite of its story, but having watched this film like five times over the last couple of years, I don't think that's the case. Obviously the final Love Hotel sequence is remarkable, but I think it's precisely the pettiness and banality of what comes before that made the film last so long in my memory. It's like, why this story? Why would anyone care? This should be boring, right? And yet, it isn't. Well, to some people it is, but not to me. Enter the Void is a film that has captivated me ever since I first watched it, every time I watch it. And it all reminds me of a certain painting I saw last year. If you could believe such a thing. So last year, I went to the Guggenheim Art Museum in Bilbao. You know, the one designed by Frank Gehry, the Simpsons guy, anyway. I was inside and, you know, looking all sophisticated. There was this vehicle exhibition, which was neat. And then I reached a room where a large Mark Rothko canvas hung. Now I'd heard of Mark Rothko before. Abigail Thorne discussed him in her video on art, so I was curious. This is the painting. It's untitled and was painted between 1952 and 1953. It depicts three large rectangular areas of color, green into yellow into red. These colour fields, as Rothko termed it, are not stably divided, with the whitish strip separating the green and yellow fields along with two orange strips coming down each side of the painting. There isn't any clear subject depicted. And Untitled is not an outlier in Rothko's work, with the style being defined by his abstract colour fields. I was... entranced by this painting. I must have stood in front of it for like half an hour. The experience I had with Untitled was indescribable. It reached into me, it arrested me, it moved me on such a deep level that just to talk about it again kind of brings me back to a similar place. And I don't really know what that place is, this amorphous, shifting feeling. But look at it. It's not the only painting that's ever moved me. I've had amazing experiences with Guernica and Wander Above the Sea of Fog, for example. I'm not sitting here to argue that Rothko's work is better than those paintings, any more than I'm trying to argue that Enter the Void is better than any other film. But it's the fact that something so seemingly straightforward and even shallow has burrowed into my soul. That's what interests me. While they may belong to different mediums, I think Enter the Void and Untitled share a lot in common. Content-wise, neither work of art appeared to have a clear message. Untitled is just these colours, and as Mark Kermode said in his review of Enter the Void, 
it's a little bit like being art mugged. You know, all this stuff goes on and rattles around in your head. You go, wow. And then when you try and assess afterwards what it all adds up to, it doesn't really all add up to very much, but style God, art mugged. I love it. I very rarely sit around thinking about what Enter the Void or Untitled have to say in themselves. I swear. What sticks with me more is the experience and how they made me feel. And this is where form comes in. Both Untitled and Enter the Void are deeply sophisticated formally. The specificity of the arrangement of Untitled's colours is uncanny, and the intensity of those colours is highlighted by the visibility of Rothko's brushstrokes. Furthermore, the sheer size of the canvas makes you feel engulfed, along with its closeness to the floor. In Enter the Void, Benoit Dibby's camera work is so dynamic, with these floating crane shots and the clever use of CGI, simulating the seamless movement of a spirit through the buildings and streets of Tokyo. The visual effects of Enter the Void are just stunning, especially given that it's a film made for 12.4 million euro in 2009. The lighting is wild, the credits are great, and the set dressing is incredible. I mean, just look how lived in these sets look. I could go on all day about the technical aspects of Enter the Void. I mean, there's the patience of noise editing, the immersive quality of the soundscape, and the sheer length of the film, which I think plays a major role in its creation of connection with the viewer, in the same way the size of Untitled's canvas operates. But that's not all I want to talk about. Mark Rothko had a lot of interesting things to say about his art. He once famously said, I'm not an abstractionist. I'm interested only in expressing basic human emotions. Tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. And the fact that a lot of people break down and cry when confronted with my pictures shows that I communicate those basic human emotions. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. And if you, as you say, are moved only by their colour relationships, then you miss the point. Here, you can see how frustrating Rothko found it to be put in this box by art critics. Critics who viewed his content as secondary to his formal prowess. I found this other quote of his in an article about Rothko's painting in order to overcome melancholy. I do not believe that there was ever a question of being abstract or representational. It is really a matter of ending the silence and solitude, of breathing and stretching one's arms again. There's something quite humbling about the second quote, given that Rothko ultimately took his own life. If Untitled is deeply emotionally charged, so is Enter the Void. Spicky Man Movies made a great video essay on how Enter the Void depicts trauma. Among other things, Spicky Man notes how the repetition of certain motifs by Noe demonstrates how Oscar sees his life as being defined by certain traumatic events, such as the car crash that destroyed his family. On reflection, I think an interesting aspect of the film is that its emotional basis isn't really conflict. At least not for Oscar. Oscar is dead and can't affect change in the present any more than he can the past. Instead, we're just locked into his gaze as he sees how he couldn't be there for his sister as a child, nor now as an adult. He glides over Tokyo, watching, until he's inevitably reborn. Or not. Interpretations of Enter the Void's plot vary. Spicky Man Movies, for example, views the events of Enter the Void as a construction of Oscar's dying mind. While one could also argue the film is just a representation of the DMT trip he has at the beginning. While I've always felt like Oscar really did go through this Tibetan Book of the Dead style experience. But even that interpretation is complicated by uncertainty over who the mother is at the end, and why the Twin Towers appear here. The truth is, there's actually no fully correct interpretation of Enter the Void's plot. It seems no way intentionally wrote it to be ambiguous. Huh. In her famous essay, Against Interpretation, Susan Sontag criticizes the tendency of Western critics to fixate on interpreting a given work of art to determine its true meaning, usually separating content from form in the process. She writes, Real art has the capacity to make us nervous. By reducing the work of art to its content, and then interpreting that, one tames the work of art. Interpretation makes art manageable, conformable. Neither Enter the Void nor Entitled are easy works of art to tame. Later, Sontag writes, Abstract painting is the attempt to have, in the ordinary sense, no content. Since there is no content, there can be no interpretation. 
pop art works by the opposite means to the same result. Using a content so blatant, so what it is, it too ends up being uninterpretable. For me, Enter the Void falls somewhere between these categories. I mean, on one hand, the film presents very straightforward content with the first 30 minutes telling you almost exactly what you're going to see. And yet, there is this question of the nature of what you've seen, whether it actually happened or is just a metaphor. But I never really think about the second part. In fact, I don't think it's a very important question. If I say the events of Enter the Void are a metaphor, then can't I interpret the film as an argument for the inherent value of life? But as speaking my movie notes, some life! So trying to find this meaning in Enter the Void is kind of pointless. Like Mark Kermode said, it doesn't all add up to very much. And yet, I am deeply moved by this film, and I'm not sure exactly why this journey through Noe's film impacts me so deeply any more than the experience of standing before Rothko's Untitled does, and I'm not sure I want to. Sontag says, Interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon the world. To interpret is to impoverish, to deplete the world. There's a magic to these works of art that I just can't find a way to pin down, and I love that. Sontag begins her essay by saying, The earliest experience of art must have been that it was incantatory, magical. Surely abstract and pop art are not the only ways we can experience this kind of magic that Sontag argues is inherent to art, right? Well, according to Sontag, Programmatic avant-gardism, which has meant mostly experiments with form at the expense of content, is not the only defense against the infestation of art by interpretations. At least, I hope not. For this would be to commit to art being perpetually on the run. It also perpetuates the very distinction between form and content, which is ultimately an illusion. Instead, she proposes that what is important now is to recover our senses. We need to learn to see more, to hear more, to feel more. In place of a hermeneutics, we need neurotics of art. Mark Rothko once said, A painting is not about an experience. It is an experience. And I know that my own experience of art museums and art in general became a lot more enriching when I stopped trying so hard to make sense of what I saw while I saw it. And instead, first, Try to let it in. So yeah, I love Enter the Void, and I love how in the opening scene, Alex tells off Oscar for doing too much DMT, and then immediately proceeds to wax lyrical about some mushrooms he did. Just like, mm. You know what, I mean, I took it, I saw that chick, man, she was gorgeous. Alright, so I've just finished editing there, and uh... Yeah, thanks if you've gotten this far. I appreciate it. This is my first video, so I hope you liked it. And um, like and subscribe, and have a good day. Thanks.